There was this terrific battle. The noise was as much as the limits of possible noise could take. There were screams higher, groans deeper than any ear could hold. Many eardrums burst and some walls collapsed to escape the noise. Everything struggled on its way through this tearing deafness as through a torrent in a dark cave. The cartridges were banging off as planned. The fingers were keeping things going according to excitement and orders. The unhurt eyes were full of deadliness. Once upon a time, the land you see was so covered with dead and wounded men that you could walk a mile into the horizon, stepping only on human form. 19,000 people fell here in seven hours on September 17, 1862, called the bloodiest day not just in the Civil War, but in all American military history. All the more frustrating because so little went to the victor, whomever that was. The most desperate and indecisive battle in modern times, wrote one general later. The carnage that shocked the generals, even Stonewall Jackson. A battle of deep sorrow, pitiless slaughter, a haunting lifetime memory for all who were there. Fate delivered 127,000 souls to this impossible moment and place where some say hell ruled. So President Lincoln gave this bloodbath his own reason just days later by renaming it a war for the freedom of the enslaved. Carnage and unmet goals bespeak a lapse in leadership begging for explanation. Who were among those that were most responsible for Antietam, its wasted lives and muddied purpose? Not Clara Barton, among the bravest, caring for neglected hundreds of wounded. Not Colonel Ferraro, who whiskied and wooed his rowdy men into capturing the bridge no one else could. Not fighting Dick Richardson, who led his division to almost shattering the Confederate Army so early in the war, and not A.P. Hill's 3,200 men, who in the nick of time set the Confederate Army aright again to fight on. But life-squandering errors can be found by Robert Chilton, who sent out a key order to a rebel general that wound up instead in the hands of the opposing commander, or by Alabama and Colonel James Lightfoot, who got an order wrong and created a fateful hole in the Confederate line, by a traumatized General Bull Sumner, who talked his commander out of the attack that could have ended the Civil War, and by General Ambrose Burnside, who insisted, according to his engineer's advice, that his thousands of men cross a shallow creek only at a heavily defended bridge. History is made by decisions large and small and decisions sorely missed. Confederate General Robert E. Lee's 50,000 tattered hungry warriors waded into Maryland to draw Union forces away from the Confederate capital in Richmond. He wrote later that his goal was to seek support from Marylanders score political points for the South and make a good showing on Maryland soil. This, Lee felt, was the last best chance for the South to strike a winning blow. Lee, Longstreet, Stonewall Jackson, and Jeb Stewart worked well together and won battles. Union General George B. McClellan had his 87,000 strong Army of the Potomac follow Lee's suspicious movements north. He feared Lee's skills, 
doubted his own generals, his president, his cabinet, and his many untested new troops. Few in his command structure had worked much with each other, and McClellan hadn't won any great victories either. A simple count of Lee's regiments in early September would produce for McClellan a troop count more than twice what Lee would really have three weeks later. Just the same, whenever McClellan looked rebelward, the saying went, he saw double word. It would take great luck, the lost order number 191, to force the battle-shy McClellan to attack and force the daring Lee to defend. On the afternoon of September 13th, wrapped around three cigars and lying in a farm field near Frederick was found lost order number 191. Lee's chief of staff and adjutant Robert Chilton had transcribed it to go to the new commander General D.H. Hill. The order containing all of Lee's plans for his army in the coming week was delivered to General McClellan at a market hall in Frederick. McClellan gloated, with this I can whip Bobby Lee or I'll go home. His army didn't really get underway until the next morning, but still moving fast enough in pursuit of the Confederates so that the last of the rebel units crossing the Antietam Creek were just two hours before the first of the pursuing bluecoats. Who lost the order will never be known, but General Lee, who seldom assigned blame in his reports and had soon known of the loss, did remove Chilton from his personal staff shortly thereafter. Chilton could not produce a written receipt from General Hill. With his army reduced to less than 40,000 men due to straggling and the losses from the rearguard fights on South Mountain, Lee dug in at Sharpsburg, eyeing escape routes through Shepherdstown and Williamsport further north. September 15th, Sharpsburg, Maryland. Lee had 16,000 men there and another 20,000 17 miles away capturing a garrison at Harper's Ferry. McClellan had 48,000 troops within short marching distance. The flying of over 60 Confederate regimental flags fooled Union General Joe Hooker into putting Lee's troop strength at between 30 and 50,000, two to three times too much. September 16th, the morning. Lee had 25,000 men with the arrival of Stonewall Jackson's division. McClellan's forces kept pouring in. Plans for battle were set. Lee put his men behind a long ridge that curved back to the Potomac behind him, and behind this rise, he would move his fewer men about quickly, creating the illusion of greater numbers. McClellan ordered his most aggressive general, Hooker, to hit the left side of Lee's line at dawn, hopefully forcing Lee to pull reinforcements from the center and right of his line. McClellan hoped a well-timed second push on Lee's vacated right would set the stage for the final fatal attack on the Confederate center, and that would be by McClellan's best and largest corps, the 15,000-strong Second Corps. September 17, 1862. It began to drizzle the night before at 9 p.m. Stonewall Jackson slept outside, his head propped on a tree root. Federals chewed on coffee. Clara Barton awoke her teamsters on the old National Pike at 1 a.m. to get a lead on a long supply train. She listened for the cannon and would get to Poffenberger Farm behind Joe Hooker's position. Wrote one, there is nothing so solemn as in the waiting silence before a summons to battle. The day began overcast, 
but it became later a cloudless, blue sky, perfect day in the mid-70s. Route 1, it was in marked contrast with other battlegrounds. On the open plain, where stood these hostile hosts in long lines, listening in silence for the signal summoning them to battle. There were no breastworks, no intervening woodlands, nor abrupt hills, nor hiding places. A smattering of musket fire at 5.15 swelled into a deafening day-long roar as Union cannon fired over a mile away behind the rebels and as cannon fired at them from the front. Two miles away, a Shepherdstown resident remembered, It seems to me now that the roar of that day began with the light, and all through its long and dragging hours, its thunder formed a background to our pain and terror. Wrote one, if all the stone and brick houses of Broadway should tumble at once, the rattle and roar could hardly be greater. Along the south side of Miller's cornfield, the first blood. At stake was the plateau beside the Dunker Church, once used by pious Germans who deemed a steeple a vain thing. 8,700 Federals and 5,000 of Jackson's men poured volley after volley at close range as heaven and hell tumbled in together. Men by the dozens were knocked into the air and fell lifeless or nearly so. By 6.30 a.m., one-third of all men were down. No feeding birds sang. Two armies were wrecked. Exhaustion set in. 2,000 of General John Hood's hungry men left their cooking breakfast their first in three days and charged like roused hornets across the crushed corn. Support on his right and left were soon coming. The cornfield looked destroyed, as if by a bloody hail. Men lay in it, the corn harvested to an inch above the ground, but by bullets. Charging the east woods, giving out a yell like a thousand bugles. Amid the incessant thunder, one wrote, we could sometimes hear amid the demoniacal clangor some charging cheer borne by the wind. Hood's men drove back General Admiral Doubleday's division 500 yards into the east woods. The 1st Texas Brigade forgot to stop. They slipped the bridle to their savagery. General Meade's Pennsylvania volunteers lay with their muskets on the lowest fence rail, the screaming Texans running legs visible 30 yards out in the lifting battle haze. Eighty percent fell, and Colonel Wolford's brigade melted into nothing. Half of the 2,000 men in Hood's division lay on the field. General Alpheus Williams' 4,700 green recruits could not push the Confederates back any further than the cornfield. Their new corps commander, General Joseph Mansfield, was just killed, and rebels were countercharging. By 8.30, a lull came. 27,000 men had fought already for three hours, and a third fell all over a 160-acre killing field. While Generals Hood and Hill rushed word to Lee that the Army's end was near, Union artillery and some infantry inched toward the prized plateau at Dunker Church. General Ambrose Burnside received a flurry of entreaties over three hours from McClellan to get busy and attack Lee's right flank. Famously modest and with good reason, Burnside stubbornly sent 5,000 men in driblets over the same stone bridge and into the sure gun sights of the rifles of General Robert Toombs' 400 Georgian sharpshooters, who looked down on them just a hundred yards away. Burnside's engineers insisted the creek could only be crossed at bridges and at two fords. But a longtime local resident insisted the creek was only waist-high. General Isaac Rodman 
went looking for the unprotected fords. Snavely's ford to the south was now without defenders. At 9 a.m., McClellan saw his best corps appearing to crush the Confederacy's left flank. Old warhorse General Bull Sumner called up the 15,000 men of his second corps. The resplendent long lines of well-drilled Union troops made a breath-stopping sight. Three compact lines running the half mile from the cornfield to Dunker Church appeared in the east, marching with Division Commander General John Sedgwick. The drums beat slowly. Bayonets of 5,300 veteran warriors gleamed in the new morning sun, the air still. General Lee watched from the nearby pike. A panicky Colonel Stephen Lee, an artillery commander, rushed to Lee. Sir, unless reinforcements are sent in at once, the day is lost. Lee said, don't be excited about it, Colonel. Go tell General Hood to hold his ground. Reinforcements are rapidly approaching. Tell him I am coming to his support. General Lafayette McClaw's 3,000 men who had been catnapping in Sharpsburg and a General Walker's 3,800 men who had been guarding Snavely Ford were now hiding themselves in a wooded area near Dunker Church. A trick perfected by Stonewall Jackson was to hide behind a ridge, wait until the enemy drew up close and in the open and out of the range of their supporting artillery. Sedgwick's men crossed the Hagerstown Pike, unaware, as they formed six close lines of nearly a thousand men each. They could only shoot well straight ahead. Suddenly, a smothering volley of musket fire raked the encircled southernmost end of Sedgwick's lines. Then, from the front, his men too close to turn and shoot sideways, collapsed into a numb huddle as 20 minutes of scythe-like waves of bullets felled 2,200 men in their ranks. General Sumner, his nerves snapped, shouted, boys, you're in a bad fix, and would later beg McClellan to not take any more chances. Confusion reigned on the left flank. Federals fleeing, rebels chasing, armies scattered, mixed, officers dead, Sumner dazed, wandering. But atop Joe Hooker's original prized plateau, there were Federal artillery, now aimed menacingly south over the Confederate line at Sunken Lane. The objective was taken and held for two more long hours, but nothing was ever done to capitalize on this gain, so great the confusion. There was a grievous lull. Clara Barton held a man as a bullet killed him, not her. 500 men needed care at Poffenberger's farm and house. Surgeons sawed and staunched wounds with green corn leaves. That's all there was. One wrote, There was an ominous lull on the left. From sheer exhaustion, both sides, like battered and bleeding athletes, seemed willing to rest. It was not safe yet to retrieve the shrieking wounded that carpeted the fields with red, blue, and gray. While the Confederates tried another counterattack across the fields, high noon approached. Alabama Colonel John Gordon, who was at the sunken lane. 
General Lee took advantage of the respite and rode along the lines on the right and center. With that wonderful power which he possessed of divining the plans and purposes of his antagonist, General Lee had decided that the Union commander's next heavy blow would fall upon our center. Sumner's two missing divisions, one of green recruits, one of veterans, had charged instead the Confederate center. A deeply worn wagon lane filled with General Rhodes and Anderson's sharpshooters safely behind breastworks. It began as General William or Old Blinky French led his some 6,000 unsure new recruits against General Rhodes' line of Alabamans. The heroic Max Weber led the 1st Brigade. And Gordon remembered, we were cautioned to be prepared for a determined assault and urged to hold that center at any sacrifice as a break at that point would endanger the entire army. The day was clear and beautiful, with scarcely a cloud in the sky. The men in blue filed down the opposite slope and formed in my front an assaulting column four lines deep. The front line came to a charge bayonets and the other lines to a right shoulder shift. The brave Union commander superbly mounted, placed himself in front while his band in rear cheered them with a martial music. It was a thrilling spectacle. The entire force, I concluded, was composed of fresh troops from Washington or some camp of instruction. So far as I could see, every soldier wore white gaiters around his ankles. The banners above them had apparently never been discolored by the smoke and dust of battle. Their gleaming bayonets flashed like burnished silver in the sunlight, with the precision of step and perfect alignment of a holiday parade. This magnificent array moved to the charge, every step keeping time to the tap of the deep sounding drum. As we stood looking upon that brilliant pageant, I thought, if I did not say, what a pity to spoil with bullets such a scene of martial beauty. But there was nothing else to do. Mars is not an aesthetic god. My first impulse was to open fire upon the compact mass as soon as it came within the reach of my rifles, but after a moment's reflection, that plan was also discarded. The only remaining plan was to hold my fire until the advancing Federals were almost upon my lines and then turned loose a sheet of flame and lead into their faces. I did not believe that any troops on earth with empty guns in their hand could withstand so sudden a shock and withering fire. There was not artillery at this point upon either side, and not a rifle was discharged. The stillness was literally oppressive. As in close order with the commander still riding in front, this column of Union infantry moved majestically in the charge. In a few minutes, they were within easy range of our rifles, and some of my impatient men asked permission to fire. No, not yet, I replied. Wait for the order. Soon they were so close we might have seen the eagles on their buttons, but my brave and eager boys still waited for the order. Now the front rank was within a few rods of where I stood. It would not do to wait another second, and with all my lung power, I shouted, Fire! My rifles flamed and roared in the Federals' faces like a blinding blaze of lightning accompanied by the quick and deadly thunderbolt. The effect was appalling. The entire front line, with few exceptions, went down in the consuming blast. The gallant commander and his horse fell in a heap near where I stood, the horse dead, the rider unhurt. Before his rear lines could recover from the terrific shock, my exultant men were on their feet, devouring them with successive volleys. Even then, these stubborn blue lines retreated in fairly good order. My front had been cleared. Lee's center had been saved. Beyond the range of my rifles, the intrepid Union commander reformed his men into three lines and on foot led them to the second charge. 
still with unloaded guns. This advance was also repulsed, but again and again did he advance in four successive charges in the fruitless effort to break through my lines with the bayonets. Finally, his troops were ordered to load. He drew up in close rank and easy range and opened a gall and fire upon my line. I must express my regret that I have never been able to ascertain the name of this lion-hearted Union officer. His indomitable will and great courage have been equal on other fields and in both armies, but I do not believe they have ever been surpassed. That battle continued. Union General Nathan Kimball also saw 600 men fall in his brigade and he rode among his men, muttering, God save my poor boys. But at one o'clock, it all changed. What was an invincible line of entrenched Confederate sharpshooters became a panic-stricken fleeing mob. Why? In the sunken lane, General George B. Anderson fell wounded and his replacement fell dead. Then the other commander to Anderson's left, General Robert Rhodes, left his men alone to care for his wounded aide. Then young General Roger Pryor commanded his 4,000 men into an already crowded line of sharpshooters that held the sunken lane so well for so long. Shoving and cursing could be heard. The alert, greasy Dick Richardson roared for his charge of his 4,000 men, his face blackened as a thundercloud and waving his sword. He was joined by the legendary commander of the famed Irish Brigade, General Thomas Maher, and by the driven men under the relentless command of Harvard-educated Colonel Francis Barlow. They charged pell-mell into the lane, reaching its edge, turning murderous volleys into the ranks of the North Carolinians and Alabamans, their frightened faces turned upward, standing in what suddenly became their own pre-dug mass grave. Bodies piled up its full thousand yard length. 2,500 rebels were killed in the sunken lane, mostly at this time, every third man. Then, a terrible mistake for the Confederates happened. General Rhodes was waving and signaling to Colonel James Lightfoot. Rhodes waved to Lightfoot to move his men out of the most dangerous portions of the lane to greater safety. Lightfoot, near panic and soon to fall badly wounded himself, misunderstood the order and turned to all his comrades and adjacent units in the lane and ordered, about face, forward march. Men broke and ran, running through corn, apple orchard, and scrambling over fences, many dropping mid-stride by the hot, thick musket fire of Richardson's men, who herded their hopeless, leaderless masses to the temporary and dubious safety of the Piper Farm. The route nearly complete with only cigar-chewing General Longstreet holding a horse while his aides fired double canister from a battery, ammunition almost gone, General Hill himself led a time-buying token charge of 200 men that quickly came running back. The end of the Confederacy was in sight, wrote one. As it approached one in the afternoon, 670 Union men promised a keg of whiskey for their efforts by their commander, Colonel Ferrero, were storming across the bridge that three hours of fighting and over 300 wounded men could not capture. Its 400 now nearly munitionless defenders under General Toombs and Henry Benning prudently slipped away, ceding their high ground. Union General Rodman, who would die that day, was also leading his men across another crossing on the creek. All, it seemed, was lost for the Confederates. But for a heated argument, about a mile away, 
between General Bull Sumner and General Franklin, his junior, and, of course, McClellan, his senior. Sumner urged and pleaded both men not to waste more men where his division had been destroyed. His nerve for battle had been broken. McClellan, convinced, agreed to countermand orders to all generals, telling them instead to stay put and wait for further orders on the right and center of the battlefield. Generals George Green, who captured the Dunker Plateau earlier in that day, and wounded Joe Hooker, whose men fought all morning, volcanically cursed at their own times and places at this kind of inaction. Just as Greasy Dick Richardson stood, triumphant, talking, near the sunken lane, expecting aid any moment from Sumner to finish off his work, a large explosion overhead left him dying, and with him probably the last best hope of a Union victory. An hour's lull set in by two, three quarters of a square mile of that day's fighting was now a stunned wreckage of human need. As a poet once wrote, not a leaf flinched and nobody smiled. 19,000 men lay dead or bleeding. At 3 p.m., guns began pounding, but only to the east. McClellan pressed Burnside harder to get his men moving over the creek and take the day. He had 8,600 men who only needed to brush aside the some 2,000 men under General Neighbor Jones, and the main street of Sharpsburg would be McClellan's. The only last escape route of Lee's wrecked army to the safety of the Potomac and beyond, Shepherdstown, Virginia. The Union forces already blocked the Hagerstown Pike, leading north to Williamsport. At 4 p.m., General Jones, once a friend of both McClellan and Burnside at West Point, approached General Lee himself, saying his line was broken and their cause lost not knowing that the last 15 minutes saw 3,200 of General A.P. Hill's men arriving from Harper's Ferry, throwing themselves immediately into battle against the extreme and very exposed left flank of the Union line east of the town. General Maxey's Greg men with Union issue shoes and parts of the Union uniform raced into a hillside of tall corn along Harper's Ferry Road, yip yipping and blazing away dropping in a few minutes one-third of all the brand new and suddenly frightened and confused Connecticut recruits. The recruits raced from the corn, spreading their infectious terror, routing men from Rhode Island adjacent to them, all soon becoming a widespread sea of fleeing bluecoats, collapsing the Union right, and for all intents and purposes, the bloodiest day in American military history. As night fell, one wrote that half the survivors roamed far and wide looking for the other half. All was still a dream to be awakened from. General Lee's chronic optimism meant a certain blindness. As dark fell, he met his lieutenants General Hood, where is your splendid division? Lying on the field where you sent them. Midnight withheld all distinction between the blue and the gray. As about 1,000 acres writhed with forms and carried oaths of delirium and cries, inside the haystacks fainted into mewling. Then, strange silence. 23,000 men in the end fell of those 82,000 who fought there that day. Many, Lee said, had been among the best soldiers in the world. Stonewall Jackson's division had never taken such losses before. 
He toasted with a peach, his army's mere survival, saying, God has been good to us. At Poffenberger Farm, Clara Barton broke open boxes of kerosene lanterns, replacing the surgeon's feeble candles for sawings, probings, and staunchings, and passed the whiskey. General McClellan, who had fought his most aggressive battle, still had as many as 60,000 fight-worthy men from his original 87,000 to finish off some 6,000 rebels who had a river to their back and almost nothing to lose. These remaining rebels ate some hot food that night and stood at Lee's orders defiantly beside their cannon all the next day, the 18th. A ruse. Waiting, it seemed, to die. But McClellan thought his work was done and telegrammed President Lincoln about his battle, his masterpiece of art, overriding Lincoln's order to pursue and, if possible, destroy the rebel army. The 18th late was almost moonless. Then a thunderstorm and Lee's discovery of just how weak his army was set cannon wheels rolling quietly down the pike, the soft shuffle of men marching at the double quick into the water at Butler's Ford. 25,000 tattered men carrying wounded and getting away. All night Lee and Jackson stood on their horses in the Potomac River as the often clogged stream of wagons and men crossed back into Virginia and home. At 10 a.m. the next morning, General Walker passed Lee at Mid-River, confirming that he was the last fighting force, to which Lee said softly, Thank God. For in a week's time, Lee moved his wrecked army down the road to Winchester where it healed and added to this tempered remnant 30,000 more men. President Lincoln visited McClelland at Sharpsburg, ignoring McClelland's demands for cabinet firings, demanding instead that McClelland pursue and destroy at once Lee's ragtag nine-lived army. But no. A month later, after Jeb Stewart's cavalry mocked McClellan by riding the full distance around his army, and McClellan still hadn't budged, Lincoln fired him. A young nation would continue killing itself for issues so divided and hopeless, many entrusted solutions to Providence alone. The war raged down its long, dusty path for 30 more months, leaving this nation with a deep, everlasting, contemplative scar. And some were nobly saved to the last best hope of earth.